I am appalled. I am upset, pissed off to the fact that I have access to $100 million worth of equipment and I still cannot do as good a cancer diagnosis as the humblest dog that has been trained for a few months. MIT's Andreas Martian thinks an artificial nose could become the most powerful diagnostic tool in history and remake medicine forever. Which is why he's been working on building a machine that works as well as a dog's nose to create... Artificial olfaction or machine olfaction. That means putting a nose in your phone. After all, dogs can detect explosives with their noses and sniff out all sorts of medical conditions, from seizures to diabetes to cancers, with up to 98% accuracy in some cases. But when Martian set out to make a robotic nose, he realized how little we even know about how smell works. What are the major benefits of my phone being able to smell me? Your phone already has an eye, it's called the camera. Oh, it has an ear, it's called a microphone. It needs to have a nose. Now, why does it need to have a nose? Why does your cell phone need to have a nose? It needs to have a nose to save your life. See this mole I have here? Yeah, it might turn melanoma tomorrow. I won't know, it won't change shape or color. My dog, if I had a dog trained to detect skin cancer, would tell immediately. Now, you wait six months and it might be a death sentence. Early diagnosis that the dogs can do routinely is the difference between life and death. If you have a diabetic child, you have to prick their finger every two hours while they're asleep. Imagine a situation of having to live in that kind of family. Your life is controlled by this disease. A dog can cure this by sleeping on a different floor than the baby. It will alert you minutes, minutes before there's a problem. If my phone smells me day in, day out, learns what my normal scent is, and alerts me to a medical condition so they can save my life, that is a good thing. I want the phone to do this. We're already carrying these things. We're already literally sleeping with these things. These things need to do more for us. <laughs> so I read uh, that dogs are 90% accurate if they've been trained at detecting things like prostate cancer. I was wondering if you could run through what else dogs can detect. So far, we haven't found something that they can't detect. Every cancer that has ever been tried to be detected by dogs has actually been detected successfully. Not every cancer has been tried. Everything else that we have to try properly, or, or even at all, I think, including malaria and Parkinson's, has worked. That doesn't mean the dogs are magical. It doesn't mean that there's no limit to what they can do. It's just that we haven't found the ceiling yet. Some of these dogs, when they are trained on one cancer, let's say bladder cancer, they will spontaneously recognize a different type of cancer that has no identical volatiles. No other system in the world does this. Nothing does this. What a good girl. Dogs are the earliest least false positive, least false negatives, cheapest, fastest cancer detectors we have. It seems like the dogs are reading the molecules, you know, the, the volatile molecules that come into their nose. They're reading them, but they're not reading just them. They're reading something written on top of them. It's like the molecules are the fonts, but the message is in the dog's mind to be able to interpret the font. The font. So, the font, yeah. The molecules are the font. The message, cancer, no cancer, bad cancer, good cancer, which the dogs can tell us, is not written on anything that has to do with the structure of each molecule. It is uh, emerged by, by something that the dogs do as observers of this. Why are dogs so much better than us and better than computers currently at smelling disease? The facetious but 90% true answer is because the nose is closer to the ground. Here's why. Most of the odorants, the molecules that confer the sense of scent, and your surfaces, leaves, soil, walls, etc. Having your nose close to the surface makes you more, more acutely aware of it, and it makes it more important to your universe. Dogs are very, very keen on reading the universe using their nose, almost as keen as we are reading our universe using our eyes. They see things in, in the ground that we don't see. If you look at where somebody has stepped, with an infrared camera, if they are not wearing any shoes, you will see their steps left behind as heat. The dog sees the same image only using his, his or her nose. They see where somebody has been by ingesting and, and processing this plume of odorants. What is the biggest challenge with artificial olfaction? The biggest challenge with artificial olfaction, I think, is still in the psychological realm. 
is no longer in the technological realm. We have devices that can detect odorants to a lower concentration than the best known available biological nose can do. What we are trying to understand isn't how the dogs detect the odorants. We already know that. We've built a dog analog as far as the detection layer goes. What we haven't built is the dog's intelligence layer. How does a dog, upon training, realize what is what? How far away are we from having your artificial nose in a phone? I do not know the answer to how long until my device is in your phone. What will happen once it's in there is we will enter a whole new era of medicine. It's as simple as that. What can building an artificial nose tell us about how scent works? We thought that when you sniff something, what happens is you get a list of molecules by name and concentration. It's like, like a recipe. If I tell you the recipe of a perfume, all the molecules as a list of, of names and concentration, will you know what it smells like? No. Neither will a chemist, neither will somebody who's trained very well, even if they've trained really well, they'll still be surprised. The only thing we know in science currently that is legit and sort of unambiguous and we haven't seen an exception is that nothing above about 400 molecular weight smells. That's all we know. I always thought that in order to build something, you first need to know how it works and then you build it. But if you really think about it, that's not how the world works. The Wright brothers did not know how flight works. Okay, they built a plane, then we understood how flight works. The air age was here. We did not know how nose works. We built a nose, now we understand how it works. In building it, we were actually slapped by the universe into understanding how olfaction actually works. Okay? The meaning you attach to scent has to do with your experience with it. At the same time, there are some meanings that are attached there before you even get born. For instance, my daughter taught me this. My daughter was uh, three. When I was changing my uh, son's uh, diaper, who was one at the time, she comes in the room and says, what's that smell, daddy? I asked her a question. What does the smell tell you? I don't want to eat it. Exactly, right? That smell tells you you don't want to eat that <laughs> Literally. I want our phones to smell us. If my phone smells me day in, day out, learns what my normal scent is, and alerts me to a medical condition so they can save my life, that is a good thing. When I'm pregnant, my sense of smell because of hormones is hyperactive, and I can smell so many different things. What does artificial olfaction tell us about subjective olfaction in biological beings? If you're pregnant, scent character changes. That's just an exaggerated um, instance of something that happens to all of us all the time. The olfactory palate of the human is about 30% variable from human to human. When you're pregnant, you're not more subjective. You're more, in a sense, objective. Your body tells you what you need and what you don't need by modulating your wants and desires from the olfactory spectrum. For instance, my wife, she is obsessed with coffee. And when she's pregnant, she hates coffee, which is insane because my wife will drink coffee at 3 a.m. But uh, not when she's pregnant. Now, what does that mean? That means that your body's taking control over your, over your um, perception. It's called perceptual engineering. Your body knows that there's something important going on that needs to engineer your perception towards different things. It makes you want and look at and pay attention to different things. And in fact, it's a big way of doing this under the radar. You don't even know that it's happening. The, the, the amount of things that olfaction plugs into, as far as your behavior goes, is insane. Some people are blind to certain orders uh, and, and same as to certain colors. You might uh, perceive a sensation of odor scent that might or might not cause you to behave a certain way. Be averse, be attracted, be say, hmm, I want to eat this, hmm, I don't want to eat this, things like this, right? Similar to vision. You might see something you're attracted to, you might see something you want to run away from, right? Having a sense of smell, it can be also predictive of health, right? And losing your sense of smell, in some cases I've seen research, can be um, a, an indicator of dementia later on. Very much so. In fact, the most, the most accurate um, predictor of Alzheimer's that we have currently, as far as I understand, is a decrement in the threshold of detection of certain odorants. How about this? If you have this, let's say, early onset pack, Parkinson's, which is a documented case, you will start being less able to discriminate between, let's say, garlic and onion. I read that 53% of young people would rather lose their sense of scent 
and their sense of smell than lose their phone. Which I think <laughs> brings to mind the idea that scent and the sense of smell is a really undervalued sense. No, it brings the idea that phones are very valuable thing. I would lose my sense of smell, my sense of smell before I lose my phone. And I am a smell researcher. Wow. Because this thing gives me power, more power than my nose does. Andres, let me ask you, you just said, and I was frankly shocked, that you would rather give up your sense of smell than give up your cell phone. Would you only do that if you were, if you knew your phone would be equipped with a sense of smell? I would not give up my sense of vision. Okay, that's too important. But my sense of smell, the kind of way that I'm using it is not important enough for me. Yes, it is good to have by my nose. Most people don't use it. The body can do incredible things. Do most of us use it? No. This has been fascinating. I have, thank you so much for your time. You guys are great, thank you.